Okay, you want to hear a joke? You know how geese fly in a V shape? Uh, you know how one side's usually longer than the other? Uh, do you know why? Because there are more geese on that side. Oh, that's good. Come on. That's a solid joke. Look at the structure. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I won a joke telling competition with that. True story. I won WWE tickets to Monday Night Raw. Did not go, but I stand by that joke. It's a good joke. Now, I tell you that joke to tell you this truth. Uh, you know how there's prophets in the Bible? Uh, you know how some are classified as uh, minor and major. Do you know why? Because they write more. Yeah, there's more words in their books. That's it. Uh, the designation between major and minor prophets has nothing to do with relevance or importance. Robin talked about this last week. Some were simply called minor because they wrote less. Um, average length of the major prophets, uh, 39.4 chapters, almost 40 chapters. Uh, average length of a minor prophet is 5.6 chapters. Yeah. Just because they wrote less, though, doesn't mean they're any less meaningful. Uh, just because they're short, uh, some people don't pay them the same attention, though. Uh, did you know that over uh, 700 lectionary scripture texts are listed? Uh, over 700 passages from the Bible are in the lectionary at some point. Um, out of that, over 700, only 12 come from the minor prophets. And I'll tell you another secret. We almost always skip them. Yeah, we never really hear from them. Uh, I believe that God inspired all of Scripture. Uh, I believe that God still speaks through the Scriptures. And so this season, I thought we would spend some time with the minor prophets. And so uh, Robin kicked us off. We're talking about minor prophets, major lessons. That's what we're going to call it. Minor prophets, major lessons. And today we're going to focus on the prophet Hosea. Uh, talk about a historical timeline. Talk about a metaphorical demonstration which prophets seem to love. And we're going to talk about how the good news is that God is the one who gets to DTR, define the relationship. Join me in prayer, and then I'll read our next passage. Almighty God, your word is living and active. May we be living and active too, and may the stories of our lives bear witness to your gospel good news. We thank you for these words of scripture and testimony, and we ask that you open us more and more to hear your voice within them and to turn towards you with our whole hearts. We love you, Lord. Amen. Hosea chapter 2. Therefore, I will now allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And from there, I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she shall respond as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer you will call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be mentioned by name no more. I will make for you a covenant on that day with the wild animals, the birds of the air, and the creepy things on the ground. I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And I will take you for my wife forever. I will take you for my wife in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy, I will take you for my wife in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. On that day I will answer, says the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. I will sow him for myself in the land, and I will have pity on lo Rahama, and I will say, lo Ami, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Okay, did anybody read the book of Hosea this week? Uh, remember the homework? 
Uh, remember, uh, we're going to try to read the books as we go through this. And remember also that Robin assigned the homework, not me. And so she's the mean one. I didn't give you that. But did anyone do it? Uh, this one's one of the longer ones if you did. Uh, remember, uh, as we're going through these, they're all different lengths. But this one is, is tied for the longest with Zechariah. And so it's 14 chapters. Uh, next week is Joel. It's only three chapters. So if you want to start next week, please go for that. Uh, it's short and quick next week. Um, I'd like to say short and sweet, uh, but I don't think you can classify any of the prophets in that way, can you? Uh, for those who read through it, you know there's, there's a lot of stuff in there, isn't there? And there's a lot of stuff in these minor prophets. There's a lot of stuff in these 12 prophetic books, especially in Hosea. Uh, and in order to get into this, you've got to kind of set the scene. Uh, let's talk timeline for a minute. Let's talk historical timeline. So zoom way out for a minute. Everyone knows where, where Jesus goes on the timeline, right? We know where Jesus is. Uh, we'll put him at, at year zero. We split time around his birth. Uh, now, scholars debate if it was actually on that year or not, but it doesn't really matter because the world has decided to shape our sense of time around that. So Jesus is, is year zero, uh, if you fast forward about 2,000 years, that's where we are, right? Uh, but rewind about 2,000 years. Uh, go back about 2,000 years. And this is the time of our ancestors. They talk about it uh, 1800 to 2000 BCE. This is the time in which we have uh, Abraham and Sarah. And we have uh, Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Yeah, we read all about this in the book of Genesis, right? And so go, go back there. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob is renamed Israel. Israel has 12 sons, and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah. Things seem to be going okay for a little while after that uh, until they don't, right? Yeah. A few centuries pass after that, and those 12 tribes, the Israelites, they're called at that time, those descendants that were doing well at that point, well, things changed, and now they're slaves in Egypt. Um, one of the descendants from those 12 tribes, one of the Israelites, uh, the one who was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, the one who was drawn out of the water, we remember these stories, the one who was raised in the house of the Pharaoh, one of those descendants was chosen by God to change this, right? And that was Moses. Yeah, Moses and the Exodus. That's our second marker, so around 1250 BCE. Moses and the Exodus. They had the wilderness wandering after that, after they go across the, the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, after they cross. We get 40 years in the wilderness, and then they finally get to the Promised Land, but, but Moses can't go in, right? Moses doesn't go in, and so they have others that help lead them at this point, others like Deborah and Gideon and Samson and and Eli and Samuel, and these people were referred to as judges, and so they'd call this section of our timeline the period of the judges, and that's from about 1200 to 1000 BCE there. And then God's people were getting along just fine and until they weren't once again, right? So God's people said, well, we like you judges, you're fine. Uh, we like this God you talk about, God seems fine too, but but we want to we wanna be more like the other nations. We want to keep up with the Babylonians, and so we, we want a king. And up until that point, they'd, they'd said God was their king. They didn't want another king. They said God was their king. And so this is a big shift mentally. This is a big shift theologically that happens, too, at that point, when they appointed Saul to be their king. And then next they had David as their king around the turn of the millennia. And then they had David's son Solomon step in, and that's it. Over the United Kingdom, they had three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. This is the United Monarchy time. That's what they called it. Uh, after that, the Israelites kind of split up. They were united, but then they split, and fights broke out, and the kingdom divided, and some of the tribes in the north got together, and those tribes in the north, they kept calling themselves Israel, and some of the tribes in the south got together and, well, they started calling themselves Judah and they had separate kings and separate kingdoms and things seemed okay again for a bit until they weren't. There's a pattern, right? Now, here's why all this is important to know uh, for our purposes this summer. Uh, here's why I'm talking timeline with you this morning. 
because that's the period in our history in which God sends in the prophets. It's right then. Now, you can boil this down as simple as you want to make it. And so around uh, 1800, you have Abraham, you have the patriarchs, and then you have uh, 1250, you have Moses and the Exodus, and then go a little further, you have 1200, Deborah and the judges, and then 1000, you have David, the king, and then in the year 922 BCE, that's, that's when the kingdom split. And that's when God sends in the prophets. Yet life continues to unravel for them because patterns seem to continue, right? You see, the prophets are speaking to God's people at a very tender time. Eventually, both kingdoms are destroyed, the north and the south. Uh, both kingdoms are eventually destroyed before they're restored because uh, they, they lose sight of their history. Um, they lose sight of the covenant and the promise. They lose sight of their God. And so each of the prophets are speaking to God's people in the midst of that time frame, in the midst of that turmoil. Uh, some are speaking to them right before the nations are destroyed. Some are speaking to them while the nations are being destroyed. And others are speaking to them right after they were destroyed as they sit in the rubble of their ruined buildings. And that's the prophets. That's the context for the prophets. And Hosea... Hosea comes to us at the beginning of this time frame. Uh, first chapter, first verse, the book reads, The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Berea, in the days of the kings of Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah of Judah, and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel. And so God is coming to Hosea with a word to deliver to God's people. Uh, we remember the biblical narrative context in this. Uh, this is after the people of God say they wanted God to be their king, but then they changed their minds. They said they don't want God to be their king anymore, and they tried having one king for a little bit, and that didn't work well, so they split, and then they tried having two kings for a little bit, but that didn't go well either. And so now the sociopolitical context of that day, specific to right now, they've had king after king after king after king. It's been like a revolving door lately with Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. Uh, in the year 745 BCE, Jeroboam's son, King Zechariah, was assassinated. And so were four of the five kings listed here in this book within just 12 years. King after king after king after king. When we read the word of the Lord that came to Hosea in the days of the kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Jeroboam, when we read those words, we read, God came with a word for God's people. After God's people had chosen this path, after God's people had figured out it wasn't working well, after God's people refused to admit that they made a mistake, the country was in turmoil, the nation was in uproar, the people of God were panicked and turning on each other, yet they still didn't turn back to God. They turned to anything and everything else they could find instead. So we have to understand this book, this word of the Lord, this message delivered by Hosea, we have to understand this in that context. We have to look at all the prophets in the midst of that backdrop. And the overarching metaphor for the entire book of Hosea is that of a marriage. The marriage of God to God's people. And to demonstrate what that marriage felt like to God, um, because all the prophets are into this metaphorical demonstration, right? Uh, to demonstrate what that marriage felt like to God, God instructs Hosea to go out and marry a prostitute named Gomer. Chapter 1, verse 2. Go take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Sorry for all the whoredoms, but that's biblical. So Hosea the prophet marries Gomer the prostitute to show the people of God what it feels like. And Gomer cheats, 
and Gomer leaves, and Gomer is unfaithful, just like Israel had been. It's interesting to note also the metaphor seems to imply that Gomer doesn't do all this simply to be mean, but because Gomer is scared. Gomer is scared and she's looking for the right things in the wrong places time and time and time again. She turned in the wrong direction. She turned to those with power, hoping that they would protect her. She turned to those with wealth, hoping that would give her security. And remember that country is in turmoil. The nation is in an uproar. The people of God were panicked, and they were turning on each other. Yet, just like Gomer, they didn't turn back to the one who loved them. They turned to anything and everything else they could find instead, hoping to fill that void they felt inside hoping to squash that fear and that insecurity that they felt, praying to the gods of this world, to the Baals of this world, rather than to their God. Yeah, you see, the bulk of this whole book just makes me feel sad. Sad for Hosea, sad for Gomer, sad for God. And sad for us. But there are glimpses of hope. There are always glimpses of hope. Uh, If you remember nothing else from this summer sermon series, I want you to remember that. Uh, No matter how hard it gets, no matter how bad things become, uh, don't ever give up on hope. Because there's always hope. That's our context because that's our God. Amen? Amen. Even in Hosea, even when things seem so bad, when, when the language is struggling to keep up with how bad things have gotten, uh, it says things in there like, her nakedness is being exposed. Uh, the shame is being uncovered. Uh, leopards are lurking all around them. It says things like this to try to get at how bad it is. But even then, even in the midst of those verses, there's hope. Because following the metaphor, even when Gomer leaves, Hosea doesn't. Hosea remains faithful. Hosea remains loyal. Hosea even pays a great price at one point to bring her back. The same is true for God. I remember last week, Robin gave us kind of the introduction to to this series that we're going to be going through, and she she gave us some of those big themes. And she said, these big themes are going to keep coming up as we go through the minor prophets. And she said things like uh, faithfulness and righteousness and, and has said that loving steadfastness. And she said they're going to keep coming up time and time again. Well, these themes, uh, they don't often look great when you look at the action of God's people in these books. Um, We're not always very faithful. Yeah, the themes don't come up because of us. Uh, Themes like this don't look great when you look at at our current placement in this world either sometimes. Uh, We're not always very righteous in what we do. Yeah, these themes aren't there continually because of us. The good news is that these themes remain constant throughout because... God remains constant throughout. In our text today, Israel is is turning every which way, right? Trying to to find help, trying to cling to control, trying to save herself. Israel is trying to save herself, and so she is turning every way she can except turning back to God. Uh, And it's not going well for them, and so God decides to take care of it. Uh, Notice the emphasis on the I statements in our passage today. Uh, What God says with these I statements, I will allure, I will bring, I will remove, I will make. It's like God uh, knows that we're not going to always make the best choices, so God's going to take care of it. I will abolish, I will betroth, God says. Uh, We keep messing up. Our actions are not 
helping the situation. Our actions are hurtful and harmful and destructive, but the good news is that ultimately our actions aren't the primary actions that define the relationship there. We keep messing up, but God doesn't. God won't. God never has. And then starting at verse 19, we get the best line of the entire book. Uh, This is where passion overrules failure. Uh, This is where mercy triumphs over our mess-ups. This is where love meets the imperfect us. Uh, Starting at verse 19, we get the best line of the entire prophecy. We get this line explicating the eternal promise. God says, I will take you as my wife forever. I will take you as my wife in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will take you for my wife in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. All those themes that Robin talked about last week, all those themes are in there. They're still in there because God is still in there. Uh, I will take you for my wife in righteousness. God will show us the right way. Uh, I will take you for my wife in justice. God will make the way right again, the things that we have made wrong. I will take you for my wife in Hesed, that's that steadfast, that constant, that never-ending love by which God loves us. Um, I will take you as my wife in mercy, that's unearned forgiveness. I will take you as my wife in faithfulness, that's the fullness of faith and trust and loyalty, even when it's unwarranty. God says, um, I will take you as mine forever. That's why those themes are in there, because they're true. Because God, not us, make them true. Friends, we're going to spend the summer diving deeper into the Minor Prophets and these major lessons that, that come out of them. Because there are things in these books that are worth talking about. There are things in these books and things that people of God need to be reminded of from time to time. And this is nothing new, right? Remember our timeline kind of way back, 18, and then 12, 50, and then 12, 10, 9, 22, they split, zero. Well, we'll keep going. It's only only a couple decades, God's people had already started forgetting um, into this new time frame. And that's why Paul wrote to the Romans in our first scripture lesson today, and he quoted this passage. He's preaching from this passage. Paul was already preaching from Hosea, and he said, Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. We need these reminders. We need to know that we are claimed and loved, even when we mess up. Even when we don't turn the right way, God will make the way right again. Even when we leave God, God will never leave us. Even when we forget the covenant, God doesn't. So when it comes to God and us and all this and where is it heading, just remember that God gets to define the relationship. God's got it. Because God's got us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Amen.